and I'm just out on the trail just bloodied and stunned and it was it was surreal. A cyclist training for a race is brutally attacked on the Springwater Trail. How the tight-knit bike community may have tracked down the evidence needed to bring in the bad guys. A pair of firefighters needed an extra hand to save a life. The complete stranger who stepped up when it mattered most. I knew she was dying. And this might just sound too good to be true. The app that promises a cash offer for your house in just 48 hours. Tonight on KGW News. And that is where we're going to start. Selling a home, of course, isn't always easy, but a popular website is offering a different way to do it. It's called iBuying, and it says it can get you a cash offer within days of listing. KGW investigator Kristen Severance joins us now with a look at the pros and the cons. Right, guys, so iBuying is an entire industry, and a very well-known name is now entering that industry. So we've all heard of Zillow or used it. You go on the site, you find a home that is for sale or for rent. We've all driven through a neighborhood, maybe seen a home for sale, and then within seconds, you can click on that house and really look inside of it and see how much that home is. Well, now Zillow wants to buy your home, but even they admit this is not for everyone. Um, I think we've been about 20 some days right now. Okay. So not Home too, selling not has too gone perfect. high tech. At least that's what companies like Zillow are banking this on. This will be the living room. And Zillow then, launched right. its offers program in Portland and Vancouver today. Zillow offers is a new way to sell your home. Homeowners no can go on the app, answer a few questions, and get an instant cash offer in 48 hours. Yeah, it's kind of magic, right? I mean, Jeff I, Knipe, I owner of Knipe Realty, so, is the um, local Zillow partner. Zillow. He you're explains what in. happens yeah. if you accept that offer. So we're going to send our value evaluation team out to look at your home and at that point you get to pick your close date whether it's five days as quick as five days up to 90 days and then we go into contract with you. Nipe says the pros uh, are obvious. Instant cash offer. Days. The seller doesn't have to have showings or do repairs. The catch there's a cost. Zillow charges a fee on average it's 7%. If you look at the 7% fee though and you look at a traditional sale with real estate fees ranging from 5 to 6%, that convenience factor is not that great. I think it's really a trade-off between uh, the price you ultimately get and how fast you get your money. Jerry Mildner, associate professor of real estate finance at Portland State University, says it's always better when consumers have more options. Just be smart about it. If Zillow says we want to we want to pay this price for your house, make them prove it. Ask them to show the comparables to determine why they came up with the price uh, that they came up with. Okay, there are other companies in the eye buying industry right now. Open Door, Knock, and OfferPad. And guys, it really comes down to, you know, if you want to pay that fee and if you think a company is going to offer you the best price for your home. So they just started this here today. Are mm -hmm. they offering it anywhere else? Yeah, 10 other cities, Atlanta, Phoenix, Dallas. And so we'll see how it's going to work here. All right. I can't wait to see how it works. I know, it's really interesting, right? It's, it's really for the right person. So if you're trying to sell your home fast and buy another one, this would be great. But if you're not in a rush, maybe you wouldn't want to use this service. All right, good tips. Thank you, Kristen. You're welcome. Appreciate it. If you have a, a story idea for Kristen to investigate, it's as simple as giving her a call, 503-226-5041. Or you can email callkristen at kgw.com. Now to a brutal attack on the Springwater Trail. A Gresham cyclist training for a race gets beat up and has his bike stolen. And now he's hoping you can help spot the crooks who got away. This attack, of course, has the tight-knit cycling community angry and up in arms trying to help out at this point. KGW's Pat Doris joining us live downtown. You talked to this rider today, Pat. Right, Dan, his name is Jay Hamlin. He's really well known within the biking community. And this attack strikes at a lot of cords, a lot of nerves from safety to the Springwater Corridor to a whole lot more. Do you know who this is? Jay Hamlin said he does, well, sort of. He said this is one of the two young men who attacked him and stole his bike last week. And he said that's the bike, his dream bike. It's worth $11,000. Oh, a lifetime dream to have a bike like that. It was taken in a nightmare. Jay was riding home along the Springwater Corridor when he saw two men walking toward him. They were African-American in their late teens or early 20s. So as I approached them and I was just about to pass them, the guy um, closest to me on the outside turned 
and he spun around and either kicked or pushed and I was doing about 16 miles an hour 16 miles an hour at the time and I just went flying off the trail down a little embankment and head first into some blackberry bushes. Jay shared these pictures of the aftermath. He has a sprain in his neck and a severe sprain in his ankle along with lots of scratches and bruises. The Springwater is a bike and runner friendly path that stretches from downtown Portland east to Boring and beyond. It's isolated in many areas, which is its beauty and its danger. Many women are reluctant to go there alone. I don't feel safe walking on it, especially as a woman. Um, you just don't know what's going to come around the corner. But others I met today say it's fine. I think the risk is pretty low. Go biking in the daytime. A big issue used to be all the homeless camps along the corridor, but there are fewer now. This runner thinks things are improving. I've never seen a lot of people popping in and out, and it seems to be like the police kind of stay up on uh, riding through and cleaning up. And, um, you know, I think most people are just here to enjoy it. I think it's going in the right direction for sure. Jay Hamlin disagrees. He thinks police should have a much bigger presence near the corridor. It's an asset that's become a liability. I mean, the people that live next to the corridor, they pay a heavy price now with, 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 the, with the theft and the, and the, and the uh, litter. And it's just, it's just so sad to see happen. It's just so sad to see how that's been let go. In the meantime, if you see this bike, Jay would like it back. It's heartbreaking to see him riding it for me. And he'd like to see the alleged crook arrested. Jay says he probably will ride the Springwater Corridor again once he's healed, but he's probably done riding it alone. By the way, his friends have set up a GoFundMe to help him with expenses. We have a link at KGW.com. Back to you. Oh, we are so sorry this happened to him. Thank you, Pat. You Portland City Hall was evacuated again today, this time over a suspicious package. Police investigated the package and found there was no risk to the public. City Hall reopened in the afternoon. It's the second time this month it was evacuated. The first time was for an over-the-phone bomb threat that was deemed not credible. Regardless, police say it's best to be cautious. If they see something, say something. Uh, definitely give us a call. We have the personnel and the experts that will come and examine whatever that is and take the best course of action. Nearby Terry Shrunk Plaza was also closed during the evacuation today. Police haven't said yet exactly what was in the package. Two strangers helped save a 23 year old woman in cardiac arrest. We first told you about this story yesterday. It happened over the weekend near Southeast Division and 11th Avenue. KGW's Lindsay Nadrich spoke to the strangers, the people who jumped in here and helped and Portland Firefighters Association about why they think this CPR call actually highlights a bigger issue. Lindsay. Well, this call had a good outcome. It does show the need for more firefighters in that neighborhood. The closest fire station is only staffed with two people, and it takes four to administer proper life support for cardiac arrest. I think we were meant to be there in that uh, moment. Um, she was amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Katie Anders and her sister Rachel Kennedy were leaving a restaurant on Division when they noticed a 23-year-old woman in cardiac arrest. Katie called 911. Well, Rachel, who just happens to be a registered nurse, started doing CPR. So I knew she was dying, so I tried to um, do a little mouth to mouth. I couldn't get any air in, so I tried compressions and um, she didn't find me. So I knew she was I, first, you know, we checked for a pulse and I couldn't find one. Um, so I started compressions. Rachel continued doing CPR and says a police officer got there first, followed by a two person rescue team from Fire Station 23. We told you about this yesterday, but I want to reiterate why this is a problem. A two person crew can do basic life support like CPR or shock someone with a defibrillator. It takes four people to do both of those things, plus get an IV started or a breathing tube in, which are both crucial when it comes to saving a life. We can't re rely on luck or hope. Hope is not a strategy. We need to be appropriately staffed so that when these calls come in, which are going to keep coming in, to uh, be able to respond correctly and appropriately. Kyle McLowry with the Portland Firefighters Association says they got extremely lucky. Someone like Rachel was there. 
but it shows why Fire Station 23 needs a four person team. The station used to have four people sometimes, but as of July 11th, it will never have more than two people because of the new city budget. This map shows the area each fire station covers. Station 23 covers this area of lower southeast Portland that includes parts of Hawthorne and Division. Out of all 31 fire stations in Portland, 23 is the only one staffed with just two people. To be a professional firefighter in the city of Portland, the 25th largest city in this nation, and arrive on scene and have to ask help from somebody who happens to be there, it's an unac it's unacceptable model of, of doing business from my standpoint. Kyle says this level of staffing should be concerning, not only for situations where someone is in cardiac arrest, but for fire calls also. Portland Fire can send backup units to help the two person team, but depending on what's going on, it could take several minutes for them to get there. The firefighters union also pointed out that the population of Portland and number of calls continues to go up, but the level of staffing doesn't and every year they're asked to make cuts. That's why City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, who oversees Portland Fire and Rescue, said she plans to push for more funding again in the fall. Back to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Portland police intervened in two very public mental health crisis situations in just a few days time. Yeah, and both of these people in these incidents, thankfully, were brought to safety by police, but they did cause a lot of traffic headaches on Friday, primarily massive delays for the evening commuters. KGW's Brittany Falkers joins us now. Brittany, a lot of people were frustrated. The police didn't just go in and physically remove these people who were in crisis. And there are a number of reasons that Portland police don't take that action. The biggest one really being that it increases the risk for injury and even death. And Portland police do tell me that they work closely with their transportation partners to try to ease that impact on the public. But they're reminding the community that when a life is on the line, intervention takes time. The potential for loss of life is very clear and apparent in those situations. Mental health crisis, it's something we hear about more and more. And while these incidents are not necessarily increasing, Sergeant Brad Yockets with Portland Police says they're not slowing down either. Our ECIT officers are called upon every day. Um, sometimes it's not as drastic, sometimes it's not as public, um, but they are truly out there making a difference every day. The ECIT, or Enhanced Crisis Intervention, team in Portland includes 70 officers with specialized training to gain rapport and work with someone in a mental health crisis. They were there last Friday when police shut down parts of I-84 for about eight hours as a man stood on the Northeast 12th Avenue overpass preparing to jump into traffic below. Then, Sunday morning, police shut down the steel bridge for over three hours, where a woman suffering from a mental health condition was throwing objects onto the pavement. There's a person, there's a human being, there's a loved one that's up there. That's why we take the time to build that rapport, to get them down safely. We're also not blind to the fact that traffic and folks are affected. It's a balance, and we try to meet that balance. In both situations, police were able to safely bring these people back to the ground without injuries. It caused a traffic nightmare for many, but it's an example of why this response cannot be rushed. By and large, it's patience, it's building that rapport, talking slow, letting the person d digest what the officer is telling them. And then we're very, very, very successful at getting that person back over the railing. Police brought them to a hospital for the help they need, but tackling mental health issues starts with the community before it gets to this point. We know that there's hope, we know that there's recovery, and we know that interventions can save lives. Lines for Life says it starts with being aware and listening to those around us. If we can really hear them and acknowledge their feelings and I let them know we see, I see you, I hear you, I care, that message can save lives. And if you or someone you know is experiencing thoughts of suicide, please call that number you see right there on your screen. It's a place where you can get help 24-7. That number is 1-800-273-8255. And we'll also have more information and resources from Lines for Life, including signs of depression and suicide, online at KGW.com. Back to you. Thank you, Brittany.